All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drmubeen.com. Welcome to one more show. This is our third show for today, and Simple Garden is first today. Hello, Simple Garden. Carolyn, hello, Simple Garden. Yes, you are the first one. <laughs> and then Carolyn is there. John Snyder, you are there as well. Carolyn, how are you, Simple Garden? So there is a chit chat going on. Michelle is here. Uh, Michelle, how are you? Um, Simple Garden says surprisingly good, which is excellent. So uh, let me let me tell you my situation. So last night and this morning was a little tough. And that actually totally makes sense because once the second shot was given, the immune system has to wake up the memory cells and have to proliferate and then have to react. And they take 24 to 48 hours, in some people even more time, to become active again. During that time, the person is going to feel the symptoms of the infection if infection is rapid. So I felt the symptoms of the spike or the inflammatory system you know, from the vac vaccine. But that happened during the night and the morning. So I had lots of uh, feverish feeling. Um, I had lots of muscle aches. I could not even support my back easily. Um, when I would walk, it would look like my legs are just so tired that they are aching. So going to the restroom would become a problem. And then um, I had headache, waves of headache. So I kept sleeping throughout the night and then waking up with this weird state. Then in the morning, I kept sleeping as well through the business hours and I didn't do many meetings. And at 11 o'clock, my EA reached out and she said, you have a marketing meeting. So I woke up and I had that meeting and we kept, kept going for about an hour and then I slept again. But then when I woke up at three o'clock, I was fine. There was nothing anymore. And so I still feel tired, but it was not that weird twilight zone I was in. So then I thought, all right, I want to <laughs> go draw some lecture. And so that is why I came in and I started drawing it. And that is the situation here. Another interesting thing, the Luffy met into my family. It is, it is so hilarious for me. So of course, uh, I love them. Uh, my mother-in-law, I, I really love her like my own mother. Um, she's very, very kind. And so she and her, her family members were sick. And uh, I talk with her almost every day saying that, hey, how are you doing? But more than once every day. And it is so funny that she says, why do you keep asking? We are fine. Everybody is fine. So she actually does the WhatsApp you know, video to show me other people and say, look, they're all fine. And that is such a stunning and magical result. And I was thinking about it, that how happy I felt that my family, when I gave them this medicine, Lufimectin, they became so well so fast. And I kept thinking that what a tragedy that doctors are not allowed to do this for their patients. The It is just so uh, weird that this is happening. So, um, so even today, just before this, <laughs> these discussions about half an hour before I was uh, uh, talking with them and they were showing me other people in the in the home and saying they're all fine. They look there, and they had called me to say, because of some vaccine, we are unable to. The, the cough is not going away, and we are tired, and we are lethargic, and we just cannot shake this. We take some anti-inflammatory, we become better, and then we stop it, and we become bad again. And they thought this was just something to do with the vaccine. And then within 24 hours, everybody became better. And now they have forgotten it. So I asked them to get the oxygen meter or get the fluvoxamine. And they said, no, we are fine. So anyways, it's kind of cute for me to see a family recovering so fast. So um, this is the updates from my side. Generally, all good. Tell me, how are you doing? Carol says that, I agree, Dr. B, we need to keep getting the word out. Yes, it is vital at this time. And I saw I saw on YouTube this latest research from India. And did that show did that paper say that there is no improvement seen 
and I saw that to be talked about. So there are some folks who are actually not very much on the ivermectin side. We, we know that. But there are some speakers on the YouTube as well who are causing this damage. OK, so Kevin says, Dr. Bean, I recovered from dose two. It was intense. Thank you very much. Congratulations. It was intense for me as well. I thought my today's day is going to be a wash, but here I am. Michael says, so glad you and your family are doing well. Thank you very much. Um, ACQ inhalation is still valid being a cardiovascular disease. Um, <clears throat> look, hydroxy has its own function, and we have talked about that, that the functions it has are Number one, it can disrupt the, um, it makes the environment inside the cell more basic. And so disrupts the viral RDRP. Then the zinc helps disrupt the viral RDRP as well. Then we've talked about the ACE2 enzymes last piece gly glycosylization does not happen because of hydroxy. And that kind of hinders the ACE2 binding, which if you see the talk we did today, that means that that is very protective as well. So hydroxy is very protect, still very protective in the presence of all of these mechanisms. So Goldmuk says, Indian medical authorities are at least now offering an advisory where ivermectin is now on a may use list of therapeutics, albeit with the caveat that they say it may or may not work. Look, here's the deal. We get Tylenol all the time, right? Tylenol has more side effects, and we get it over the counter. So fine. These authorities can say that hey, it may or may not work, but let people use it. Um, Colombian Coffee Bean says, thanks for all the for the talk tonight. I came in late, but I'll go back to hear it all. Thank you very much. I think it's an interesting talk today. Uh, France says, this is a great news. Thank you very much, France. Uh, Susan Pick says, question, hey there, Dr. Bean White Collections, got to talk to my doc. Zomig is a serotonin receptor agonist. Interesting for us, acute migraine sufferers thoughts. So the it is interesting to, to be able to use it. So again, migraine has two phases. In one phase, it is good to um, dilate the blood vessels. And in the other phase, it is good to rest, uh, constrict the blood vessels. So in one phase, it will be useful. Doug Gross says, how and when do spike proteins get into the blood? Is active virus getting into the blood at what stage of COVID-19 in how many or what kind of patients does this happen? So very, very good question. I was hoping that somebody would ask me this. So thank you for asking it. Um, let's look at this one. So <clears throat> I'm going to take this concept from uh, Dr. Jalali's discussion. So here we have a blood vessel. And the blood vessels have various thickness depending upon what kind of a blood vessel are there and are these and so on. So I'm going to go for a more uh, capillary-like blood vessel, so single cell dense blood vessel. It doesn't have any other walls on it, so it is actually easy to get in or out, but it still is very tightly controlled, the gaps between the cells. Remember the discussion that there are pericytes? So this is Dr. Jalali's discussion. There are pericytes which would then, as the virus starts causing inflammation, and as the heparin and, uh, sorry, what is that, serotonin starts getting released, that would cause the pericytes to start becoming shrunken and getting away from the, or stepping out of the path, which would then allow the activity, the inflammatory systems to start working on the endothelial cells in the capillaries, which would then cause the endothelial cells to start becoming contracted. When they are shrunk, they are trying to actually bring in more things outside and wash away more debris. But in that process, they will wash away some SARS-CoV-2 as well. And now it really depends who has how much SARS-CoV-2 entering the blood vessels. 
and then causing the issue. Interestingly, now the blood vessels have their own ACE2 as well. So they're going to try to capture the, the SARS-CoV-2. Once it is captured in a blood vessel cell, then it is going to infect that cell, replicate there, and it's going to then release viruses that are going to be released in the blood vessel and under the blood vessel. And this cell is going to be damaged. So now we have a active factory of making more viruses happening inside the blood vessel. And so now the virus is just going to keep going. So that is how this is just one mechanism. The throat infection can result in some viremia to occur. Um, other tissue damages can cause viremia to occur. But a general mechanism is this. Clinton says, could there be sufficient vaccine generated spike proteins free circulating to cause vascular or other diseases? So the short answer is no. And the the a little more explained answer is this, that this is the um, deltoid muscle. In this muscle, we inject the vaccine. The ideal uh, situation is that the local cells the immune cells, the fibroblasts, the muscle cells, they are going to pick up this vaccine. It's a tiny amount of vaccine. And they are going to start processing it. Macrophages are going to pick up this one and run to the lymph nodes and go. And this is like a child going to their home and showing to their family, their mommy and daddy that, hey, look what I brought. So macrophages would run with the lymphatics to the lymph node and show to the B cells and T cells and say, look what I got, got over here. So that is the primary uh, route or the utility of the vaccine. There is very less vaccine that would end up in the blood vessel. But let's say there is some vaccine that ends up, some lipid nanoparticles somehow end up in the blood vessel. If they end up in the blood vessel, now they will have to be picked up by the endothelium. And the endothelium will make the spike protein and the same process would occur again. And those blood vessel walls can be attacked. But this is such a tiny amount that our body can very easily handle this. It is not an active replicating virus that is just entering a cell, making millions of more viruses then coming out of it and then entering the next cell and making millions more. That's not happening. It's just a vaccine piece. So whatever are the number of uh, original particles of the vaccine, they are not going to increase. And then when the vaccine enters a cell, it's not going to. So if it is inside a cell, it's not going to replicate there like a virus and then come out and then go to the next cell. That's not going to happen. So because of these, uh, this thinking that somehow vaccine will produce um, anti um, spike proteins that would just run around in the body. And <laughs> weird thing, I was not sharing my screen. Let me share my screen. Just to show you what I was talking about. My apologies. Sometimes I forget to share the screen. So here. <laughs> This is the deltoid muscle. This is the vaccine. The, the macrophage goes to the lymph node here. And then some particle, if at all. So I am forcing this mechanism. Normally, it will not happen. But let's say by force, we put some vaccine in the blood vessel. Then it would go to the endothelial cell. And they would present the, the vaccine as well. And they would present the antigens. And they would become the target of inflammatory response. But that is a very tiny controlled area. Uh, Interestingly, like a virus, a vaccine cannot just go out of one cell, let's say spike proteins, and then those spike proteins go to another cell and infect that, and then another cell. That's, that doesn't happen. Vaccine produces the spike proteins. Those spike proteins are broken down inside the cell into smaller pieces through the endosomes, and they're loaded on MHC1 or 2. Then they're presented on the cell surface. That is how it works. And I have mentioned it before that it is possible that you break this cell like an egg. Let's say a cytotoxic T cell comes along and says, well, this cell is infected or this cell has something weird. It is presenting these antigens. I'm going to break it. So it is possible that that breakage would then cause some spike proteins to leak out. Now, those spike proteins are still not going to go out and just cause viremia because they are not viremic. They are not virus. So they are going to be picked up by macrophages that are sitting here. Macrophage is going to say, oh, yummy, look what I got. And it's going to try to eat this and, and clear it up. OK. So question, white 
<laughs> my screen share how do so i hope this this makes sense now doug sorry i was not sharing my screen uh, kevin says how effective is ivermectin with long haul covid and anxiety panic from covid and has magnesium shown to help so the the anxiety and panic could be a neurological uh, outcome in that case fluvoxamine is supposed to be doing better than ivermectin although ivermectin has been very very effective as well for me what is interesting is that all those folks who are working on long haul and they are doing a great job so for example dr bruce peterson has the incel and they have their own uh, kit there with dr yo um flccc is working with uh, long haul they are working with me for long haul as well clinically i'm seeing that at the end of all of this there are a set of um, medicines that are helping that could be steroid that could be ivermectin that could be fluvoxamine that could be some other uh, as well uh, medicines so looks like the the final common pathway reaches a point where we can use um, these drugs and i have done a discussion about why these drugs would help and uh, <laughs> actually dr paul marik has asked me to put that together and dr kori and i haven't uh, i would do that okay so <laughs> john yes has made it finally he thought tonight was a pass i thought it was a pass but i was feeling better so i thought i'll i'll do the talk and yes francis saying paw the like you lazy beans i'm sure that france you you meant paw right so yes please paw the like button alex hunter says question i think the proteins are floating in the blood did they check the blood to confirm it is not the case i don't remember seeing that data this is a serious issue so very good question number one their discussion was not to see this inside the humans they were looking at this in hamsters number one number two they they had actually created specialized zombie particles with spike proteins and they wanted them to be injected into the areas where they would float around in the blood so this was a um excuse me this was not a study to say can we prove spike protein can go in the blood or not the the study was proving that if there is a spike protein that binds to ace2 in the endothelium or on the endothelium then what happens so they had all the right um lab set up to make that happen now if you say that uh, you have read it so yes there are many um, even uh, when i was looking at some of the discussion by dr paul marik about the pathology he was also referring to the to the papers that are for uh, from the autopsies and in the autopsies they show spike proteins in the virus to be present in many of the tissues and i have done this discussion many many times we in case of autopsy if you back up from somebody dying to becoming ill of course they became ill with such severity that they died that also means that the acute respiratory distress syndrome occurred that also mean that sepsis occurred that also means that the brain uh, the the barriers of privileged sites they broke that also means that the blood vessel barriers broke and the virus can be found everywhere the more interesting thing is to find virus in the tissues and blood vessels or the spike protein without having someone die so um, the question here that have we seen spikes in the blood we can see spikes in the blood i just made this mechanism over here that if you break a cell that is making virus or is vaccinated spikes can come out but those would be picked up by macrophages as well in the blood there are mopping systems as well monocytes are present so the question is can we make spike proteins that would just run around in the blood that's really not easy to do so o1 says what would happen if a person gets infected with both sars and covid so you i hope you're saying that sars 1 sars cov 1 and covid um i think that if somebody had if they they are co infected then he will have to fight them or he or she would have to fight with both of them 
uh, if they had one and then the other one, then the previous infection would give them protection from the next one. Now, what is the percentage of protection? I do not know. Um, <laughs> Francis, they would need legs first, then they could run around in the blood. Yes, actually, in the blood, we have a, this is a blood stream, like, a, you know, the ocean streams. So they'll just have to have some flappers, and then they can just swim around. OK, so more questions. G unit says, uh, are you following Pfizer myocarditis in under 30? Should young people who are isolating low exposure get them in your weight for traditional like Novavax? So I still have not done the research on this. I know that I owe this research, but you, you are seeing on daily basis, um, I'm looking at something. So I'll try to do that tomorrow if I can find good data. Now, the second part of your, your question, should young people who are isolating low exposure get messenger RNA or wait for traditional like Novavax? So in my opinion, they should get this. The problem is, what I cannot understand is that how did Pfizer vaccine do it? And is Moderna doing that or not? If Moderna is also doing it, then it must be either the adjuvant or messenger RNA structure that is making some spike protein issue. issue. Maybe antibodies against the spike protein are made in a way that are cross-reacting with the cardiac tissue. So without knowing that mechanism, for me, it is difficult to say, take the vaccine or not. Just like we know that adenovirus-based vaccines cause thrombosis or thrombotic thrombocytopenia, then we can say it with more confidence to say, OK, women under 50 years of age, be careful with this one. I am not at that point yet to be able to say that. So give me some time. <laughs> Susan says, need 70, 75.5 more pause. 75.5 is a very specific number, Susan. Um, so one request that if you have a question, put question marks or QQQ before it so I can find it. Otherwise, it just looks like a comment to me. Um, Morris says, has anyone calculated the threshold SARS-2 level for specific reactions? Which reactions? Uh, Vivek says, what's this with raising cases of mucormycosis in COVID recovered patients? Cases with mucormycosis is getting very high post COVID in India. Please enlighten. So Vivek, the most possible cause may be that their, their immune system just got a beating and they are down, they are weak. And so fungal opportunistic infections can occur. But this is just me theorizing. It's not based on some data that I've seen. So I have to look at that data as well. Fun says, would you please tell us about the recent studies on this article? Patients who have recovered from COVID-19 may be at risk of getting blood clots. Study by the Straits Times. Hmm. Let me take it down. I'll have to. Pa recovered patients of covid risk of blood clots. OK, <clears throat> I look into that. Alex says, the issue is we are doing this in huge quantities. Uh, doing what? Uh, vaccination? We need the exact math. Who did the pharmacological? compartmental distribution studies, it's very hand wavy. Agreed, but I still, uh, are you talking about, Alex, the spike proteins or the vaccine or the infection? Aditya Chipa says, I took fluvox fluoxetine, kind of like fluvoxamine, once and it made me feel spacey, weird. Can I get the same reaction from fluvoxamine? I'm scared to try it. So they are similar, but it is possible that you may not. So try to reduce the dose for fluvoxamine and then try it. Again, talk with the doctor as well. For example, instead of taking 50 milligram, 
that day, Dr. Heather was saying some people actually like to take just nine milligram and it worked fine. Some people were at 12. So maybe adjust the dose. Uh, Daniru Raja Paksha says, are there already COVID-19 specific antibodies circulating our in our blood even before the vaccination or infection? And if there is, can't we enhance that antibody production by boosting immune cells? So the short answer is no. If we had the antibodies, then we would not have the disease. A more elaborated answer is that those folks who may have coronaviruses with them, they may have some partial protection from SARS-CoV-2 as well, because SARS-CoV-2 is kind of 86% similar to other coronaviruses. So if they may have antibodies that would try to work with it. But of course, uh, if they are asymptomatic, that means their antibodies are already working correctly and they do not need to enhance. And if they are getting uh, infected and then having the disease, that means these antibodies are useless and would not uh, using useless in a more uh, loose term, and they are not protecting as much. But it is possible. Asymptomatic have these antibodies and they're protecting them. Mild cases have these antibodies and they're protecting them, and the severe cases do not have it. But this is, again, a conjecture. So Danielle says, why wasn't the vaccine created using traditional methods vaccine. So there are vaccines created with the traditional methods. For example, the inactivated virus vaccines are traditional. For example, the adenovirus, they're not as traditional, I think about 10 years span compared to 50 years or 60 years span, but adenovirus are traditional as well. Moderna and Pfizer are the only one that are really cutting edge and they are the most modern. So if we say that, hey, why did they use Moderna or Pfizer? At the end of the day, I actually like Moderna and Pfizer like vaccines more than adenovirus or more than inactivated uh, virus proteins. I like this technology better. Just give the cell a messenger RNA, let the cell make the protein, shred it, show it on the surface and get the immune system trained. I like that more than having an adenovirus come in and disable the adenovirus and or having an inactivated virus come in. Anna says, my mother is vaccine hesitant, and she is worried that if she gets the vaccine before long, they're going to want boosters and then more boosters until the end of time. What can I tell her? So uh, this is a question my friend asked me today as well. I was <laughs> lying down in the morning and he called. Uh, and so we talked about it. He had the same question because he got the second Pfizer dose and he, he was just curious. So I'll give you a technical answer, not something that would work for your mom to listen or not. The technical answer is that if you look at previous infections from SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV, the studies have shown that antibody production against these viruses continued for two years and declined in the third year. That is a long enough time for this virus to go away. And then they also saw after 10 years that the cytotoxic T cell memory, cytotoxic T cells were present even after 10 years and became active when the SARS-CoV was exposed to those cells again. So we do produce long-term um, immunity. From a data point of view, we can only have the data for whatever time has spent. And we know that for eight, nine months, there is uh, um, antibodies that are produced. So will we have boosters or not, in my opinion, from looking at the previous data and uh, studies, it does not look like we would need um, boosters. At the same time, because this is a virus that is gonna go into billions of people, it would have a lots of chance to continue to mutate and figure out new ways. So it is possible that some SARS-CoV-3 might appear for which we may need a booster. But I think that so far this virus is not successful in reaching that kind of a goal. So uh, I know that these CEOs and the companies have said we would need boosters. Um, I think they are managing expectations at this time, but maybe they are following the changes in the spike protein and thinking, well, in a year time, there will be so much change that we would need to give some more booster because efficacy will go down. If that is the case, then 
hopefully we'll not need further boosters. So CC says, question, women taking birth control can take the vaccine even though it is not, it is known to increase blood clots. I'll give you two answers. One is my answer and the other one is official answer. My answer is a woman under 50 years of age taking uh, birth control or not. For her, adenovirus based platform is not good. So that means Johnson & Johnson, that means um, Sputnik, that means AstraZeneca are more risk to her. Now, there is no study to connect that if they have their own birth control and they already have a propensity for clotting, does this increase that or not? There is no data for that. The official answer, I think we all know, and that is that um, European Medical Medicine Agency or US CDC and FDAs, they say that the risk is so low that we think it is fine to continue doing it. We should just tell the women that, hey, the risk of clotting is higher. So that is not a very reassuring message. I still believe in this, and I kind of repeat it every day. I still believe in this, that the message, complete message should have been one, we think that the women under 50 should not take this. There are options like Pfizer and there are options like Moderna. Please select that. What is so bad about this? We have ample vaccines. If you are going to take Johnson & Johnson or AstraZeneca or Sputnik, then please watch out for following symptoms and let your doctor know, and the doc doctor should know these symptoms. And if those happen, here is the the way to move forward, go to the doctor, they would start putting you on anti-clotting and, and so on. And we would have started you on antithrombotic right after the vaccine for five, six, 10 days. This is, I think, should have been a protocol for this to protect the people uh, from ending up in this state. I think what they did was they did the, you know, cover your behind kind of a thing by saying, we are pausing, then we are saying, okay, we are lifting the pause, but they have not done the actual homework to protect the women. This is silly at best to say, well, if you look at this vaccine, it can increase the thrombosis or cause more propensity of thrombosis or clotting. So if I am that woman who is looking at that, so what do I do now? <laughs> Fine, you told me that this can kill me, now what? So the, I think there has to be a solution with it, and there can be a solution with it. If there was no solution, then you would say, fine, I'll have to, for example, if a plane is flying, we have no control over it if it would continue flying or not. So then you are taking a risk. Here, there is a control over this. You can actually manage this. Then why not put that protocol together? OK, so Kevin, what's the maximum dosage of ivermectin, and it, is it safe to take the next day? So Kevin, uh, I'll tell you about my family. When I am treating them, I am treating them with 0 0.4 kilogram per, uh, 0 0.4 milligram per kilogram body weight. And I'm giving them the ivermectin continuously. And even today when they were all happy and giggly and saying, we're all fine, I said, don't stop this. I want you to continue with this for some more days. So um, there is no therapeutic protocol for this one. There are doctors who have tried 0 0.6 milligram per kilogram body weight in Mexico. There are doctors who have tried even higher doses. I had always kept myself into in 0 0.15 to 0 0.2. Now I have gone to 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 milligram per kilogram based on uh, the health of the person and where are they located. For example, India, Pakistan need higher doses. So that is how uh, I see the dose. How often can you take it so far? I have many, many patients that kept taking this dose uh, for five days, six days, 10 days, and they were OK. But there is no data to say it would cause any toxicity after six days or 10 days or 20 days. Uh, Elizabeth says, 
Dr. Bean, would you please share your opinion of this medical article that says fully vaccinated individuals are at higher risk of catching variants? I have to read this one. Um, okay, let's see. Fully vaccinated individuals are at a higher risk of catching variants. Now, just to give you some more color, there is a study that had come out from Israel that said that fully vaccinated people had more um, the breakthrough rate for the, I believe, South African variant was more in them. But what they had not told it, and I had to go scour their uh, Twitters of those authors to find out this little piece that they didn't put in the study. And that little piece said the following. And I believe uh, Cool Beans remember this. I thought that was really not good to do. Uh, here is what they had done. They had said, the study actually was this. You tell me, what do you, <coughs> excuse me, how do you feel about it? Dose one, dose two. Let's say seven days after the dose two, which is the fully, full protection. Full protection. Then a week after, so 14 days after the second dose, which is, let's say, continuity of the full protection. This study actually only looked at this one week. Because after that week, the variants were not infecting. Before that week, variants were infecting, but they considered that the person is not fully vaccinated. So they, this study actually was only based on this one window, one week's window. And then they had tweeted out that please go take vaccines because after this 14th day, after the sec end of the first week and in the second week, there were no variant infections found. Now you tell me, I responded to this and I said, that means change the fully vaccinated definition from seven days to 14 days. Ask people to be more careful till 14 days. That's all. So if uh, Elizabeth, you are, if this article is in a similar line, then we already talked about it, but um, maybe this is something else. I'll look into that. So Rizabit says, uh, do the five, this is the medical article evidence for increased breakthrough rates of SARS-CoV-2 variants of current. In yeah, yeah, so we talked about it. We already talked, this is, this is the same thing that I'm talking about it. Uh, so there is a video I talked about that, please check it out. Denise was saying something. Denise says, let me look at what it says above. Where Denise? Zigzag says, I have read some had adverse reaction to vision after vaccine. Could this worsen macular degeneration? I haven't heard of the macular degeneration because of this. The vision disturbance was one with the thrombosis. So people could have visual vision disturbance because of blood vessel and the nutritional uh, impairment to the uh, neurological system, including the optic nerve. So that is what I've heard. Uh, there may be uh, neurological symptoms as well, but I have not heard about macular degeneration. That would be too extreme of an, a side effect to cause macular to degenerate. Macular needs pressure on it or needs ischemia to degenerate. So Maximus says, how is your son doing after Pfizer? Was there any decision making behind choosing that one? So no, so we all just took whatever was available that day. So for example, when my wife went for Johnson & Johnson, they said, we have Johnson & Johnson. I showed some hesitation. I even said when we were standing in the line to say, you want to skip this one? And she said, no, I, I want to go ahead. So that is the only one that was available. My wife had severe joint pains. She had headaches. She had, uh, she, I cannot even imagine. I used to see her walking in into my studio here, walking like a you know robot. And this morning she was saying that I still have my joint pains. They, they, are, they are less, but I still have them. So this is a month after. 
And the second thing she said was that I become frozen. So when I'm sitting in some posture, if I stay that way for a longer time and I move the joints afterwards, I get pain. So that these were the two things she was saying. Um, my son, after the first dose, had a lots of GIT disturbance and um, he had uh, he could not sleep for many days. He thought there is something wrong with his brain, that some tissue damage has occurred and he cannot sleep properly. And he thought this would happen forever. So he was not very happy. Uh, fortunately, uh, his doctor started helping them and uh, he was better. Now this Sunday he's going to go for his second dose. So I'm praying that he does not get more side effects. But this is the update from us. And you have seen already my situation. So um, BMW says, Dr. Bean Medical Lectures, where can we find the best resources and vaccine side effects to date? Thanks, Donna, from uh, <laughs> what is this place? I know that this is uh, a fruit. So Donna, verse, for at least US, verse is. The problem with the verse is that the data is not collected and compiled and shown. You have to do your own homework. The a better area is to look at Israel's studies about the Pfizer's uh, work. Arun says, after COVID, how can we know if thrombocytopenia is caused by immune autoantibodies, ITP, drug-induced septicemia, platelets less than 40K? Very simple. If the patient is going to have, let's say, septicemia or platelet issues, they're not. they're going to be in a hospital. They're not going to be at home. They're not going to be after COVID. They would just be stuck. So these are serious situations. Similarly, idiopathic thrombocytopenia, ITP, a patient just like Florida doctor. We don't, they said, we don't know why it happened. It happens in people. I still believe it was because of the vaccine, but uh, there is not much information there. So the how do we know what is it? Ideally, there should be tests done for that, and that protocol is missing. That protocol is missing, and I really do not like that. Kevin says, uh, for your son, I had those two Pfizer and had some chest pain and aches. Just heads up, it's normal. Have your son drink one bottle of water an hour before second day, two days after shot. OK, we will do. Thank you very much. <laughs> George Smooth says, Donuts Kiwi. And I like this uh, uh, Ivermectin man over there. Uh, Zana says, Sir, do you think that some people who claim that fully vaccinated people are more weaker to other viruses, is it true or false? Other viruses, if you're talking about variants, then it is false. Other viruses, it really depends upon the person's immune system. This vaccine will not do anything one way or the other. I know the medicals will come back or the PhD in immunology would come back and say, there's a possibility of trained immunity and there is a possibility of cross immunity, got it. Yes, there are those possibilities, but generally there is not much. So um, if your question is about variants, then the efficacy can be dropped, but those uh, rumors and misinformation of the depletion of the innate arm and the complete obliteration of the innate arm, that is not something that happens. Blues Lover says, we all agree that keeping ivermectin from people and treatment is horrible. With, this, with that knowledge, how can I trust the VAX manufacturers? Thank you, by the way. <clears throat> I have no way of saying that the vaccine manufacturers should be trusted or not trusted. Um, so... I, I cannot say to trust them or not. My only example would be that I got the vaccine. My wife has the vaccine. My son has the vaccine. Now, if we are making a mistake, then we are making a mistake. Uh, I see that one downside of me never pushing away someone who is anti-vax and pulling to get closer to someone who is a pro-vax is that the anti-vaccine folks, when they hear these things from me, because they are with us as well, they're cool beans too, some of them then react badly and then they curse me and they call me names. And so I think at the end of the day, these are bigger questions, which I cannot answer. My role is to pick up data and bring it to you. 
your role is to make decision for yourself my role is to make decision for myself somebody asked me that how dare i open my mouth and tell the people that i am vaccinated i should shut my mouth <laughs> and uh, i told them that this is my choice to get the vaccine and this is my choice to share it you don't like it then it is up to you um Aditya says, why the taste goes away in COVID even though a person is taking ivermectin for three days? So uh, ivermectin dose has to be high. So one of the persons in my family who has this, they don't have the smell. Uh, smell. It's not the taste that goes away, but going smell becoming bad becomes the flavor becomes bad and taste seems bad. And uh, I haven't yet given a higher dose, but this they are supposed to get more uh, uh, higher doses for a couple of days and that brings the taste back ajay says i totally support you dr bean thank you very much eric doc says if gambling <laughs> gambling bean in aussie he can share his views with <laughs> Eric, you're always funny. I got so thank you very much for the coffees yesterday. In there as well, I saw your gambling bean. So that is your new name for me. Okay, so question Neri says, Dr. Bean, please look in NIH for informed consent disclosure to vaccine trial subject the risk of COVID-19. Sure. I'm sure that the disclosure would be something like you're gonna die. <laughs> Ash Verma says, you had referred to a study showing threshold for protection by neutralizing antibody equals 50, uh, receptor binding 100, and this for eight weeks, which threshold can be correlated? Antibodies in blood after eight weeks. Or... So uh, Akash, I remember the study as well, and I had some questions near that as well, and I had said, I will have to do the math to collect them. So maybe tweet this at me so we can kind of separately do the math and figure it out. Aditya says, for me, ivermectin as prophylaxis didn't work. Why? Uh, I do not know what was the structure, what was the amount you took, and then how many, what was your frequency. And finally, that day, Dr. Heather said that he has seen that with ivermectin and fluvoxamine, 99% uh, protection. Uh, the studies that I have been using, they have shown 74, 80% protection. So that means there is still possibility of catching the infection. The good news, it seems to me, is that the infection doesn't become severe. So that is how to look at it. There is, it's not 100%. Neither is a vaccine 100%. <laughs> Denise says, Eric, you're funny. I said, Denise, don't, don't encourage him. <laughs> All right. So uh, MS Pammy says, how long to know when messenger RNA is cleared of thrombosis and clots? Uh, messenger RNA is cleared of thrombosis and clots of so data problem safety after vaccine. Okay, so let me see. What you're saying is, <clears throat> so messenger RNA is cleared. I think the connection is adenovirus-based vaccine and the clotting is more common connection compared to messenger RNA-based systems. And the the way to look at that is that we know. So remember, they say, here is the dose one, let's say, given. Then within five days to 17 days is the time to observe. Nine days is mean. That means 50% of the population by the ninth day would have developed the clotting if they were going to develop it. <clears throat> this is that time that is related to starting to produce antibodies. So this is the time of the acquired arm to become acquired. I have no idea. Acquired arm. It is the acquired arms of function that was that is going to start from here. It could go up till here as well. That it is starting here. And so, uh, to answer your question, it is the five to seventeen days window that needs to be uh, to be observed for um, clotting. And there are a bunch of. Uh, symptoms that we have discussed in the past to be aware of. Sharon says, is pedal edema 
a frequent is frequent after AstraZeneca vaccine. No, I did not hear of that. So edema on the feet or swelling of the feet. Um, I have not heard of that. So please check with your doctor so that they can do uh, any test if they need to. Because it is possible that there is a, a clotting. So I don't want to scare you. But the only reason somebody could end up with swelling of the lower limb is that if, let's say, here is a foot, and then the malleolus should be here. The veins that are going up and taking the blood back, if there is any possibility of clotting there and the blood is not flowing back correctly, then that blood is going to start accumulating in this area. And that is what would cause uh, cold leg and the edema. So if this is the case, please do talk with your doctor to see why this is happening. D says, I noticed that many people are getting really sick after taking both shots. Why? So the first shot primes the immune system. It creates the watchdogs. The second shock, shot goes and pokes them and says, you're there. And these watchdogs wake up and they just attack it and they proliferate in number. They increase in number. They go mad. They make more antibodies. So the person is going to have that inflammatory response for some days. So that is what happens after the second shot. So for example, what happened to me yesterday is very much like if I actually now got COVID. What would happen is imagine if I got COVID today, I am, uh, I am vaccinated, let's say protected, not protected, but vaccinated, my immune system is going to respond. So then for 24 hours, my immune system is not going to do much. If I have IgA, then there would be some reduction in viruses capability but still my immune system is still sleeping and the virus is going to start entering my cells and start uh, replicating and it is possible that e even it would cause disease during this time so the difference between infection and disease is infection is when the virus arrives in us and goes into our cells that is infection not every infection causes symptoms but if the symptoms start appearing enough damage to the tissue occurs that we start coughing and we then that is a disease. So it is possible that the COVID disease symptoms appear within 24 hours because of the newer variants are faster in entering the cell. So I might get sick for a day with the COVID. But within that time frame, within 24 to 48 hours, the immune system would wake up. It would open up its eyes and say, whoa, we got this antigen once more. I'm going to attack it. And they're going to start making antibodies. And cytotoxic T cell would start doing their function. And hopefully, they would capture the infection from spreading. And that is how a person's experience will be. Kevin BR says, are patients that are considered cured having any effects weeks after or months? There are long haulers, but they in the beginning, we say that, yeah, they have cured and then they become long haulers. Uh, so I was discussing this with Dr. Paul Marek over the email. Uh, my thinking is that long hauling is a continuity of the disease. And his paper was mentioning, and again, it's not that he was saying it one way or the other. His, pa his paper was not considering long haul as a continuity of the disease. So I think it is a continuity. So we'll see. But long haul can occur. So somebody said, Abdullah, please stop spamming. Uh, Abdullah Musa says, today's news saying evidence is becoming clear. AstraZeneca blood clots risk are higher than first expected, especially in younger people. And now uh, JC, we are restricting it for under 40s. How is your Ramadan going? So thank you very much for the uh, news. My Ramadan is going good. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, what is the mechanism for long COVID? 
Alex says, what is the mechanism for long COVID? I hope you, you mean long COVID. So a few days ago, about a week ago, I had done a presentation to Cool Beans here where I discussed that what may be possible mechanisms. I think that in that video, there may be one correction to make that there may not be persistent virus or there may be. That area is still not clear. But what may be possible for long hauling and then what may be the management, I've discussed it over there. So Zishan Malik says, can pregnant women take ivermectin? So I'll give you two answers. One is the answer in the textbooks. And the other one is the answer that we are hearing from the doctors. The textbook says ivermectin should not be given to a pregnant woman because it can cross a blood-brain barrier. Placenta go to the baby, cross a blood-brain barrier because the blood-brain barrier is not yet very fully formed and may cause brain damage, Some in some cases permanent. So why to take a risk? Uh, again, this would have to be a doctor's choice as well to see that is the risk of getting COVID more, maybe they're in a hot spot, and would that cause both mother and child's death? Now they have to figure out how to uh, know what to do or not. But in literature, in text, it is contraindicated. Similarly, children under two years of age or 15 kilogram of weight, body weight, are also contraindicated. The second part of the answer is that if you look at some of the doctors who are um, suggesting to take FL, um, ivermectin, they feel that after the first trimester, it is OK. I do not feel that at all because the neurological development is not fully done within the first trimester. A baby actually keeps making the myelin sheaths and the uh, tissues for even two years after the birth. Mm -hmm. So these are the two answers. And I, told, I also told you what I believe. William. William Gov says, CDC is saying there are 5,800 breakthrough cases after fully vaccinated. I don't find that surprising. But what I do find surprising is 74 died. That is 1.3% mortality when other mortality is 1.8%. So that simply means that there was the vaccine didn't do much for them. Interesting. Colin Hamill says, any reports from the first people in the vaccination trials? I'm sure that they are collecting data. I haven't seen any follow-up report yet. <clears throat> so <laughs> there is a good question and I do not <laughs> so Omak Lamok says in China they promote a Chinese medicine Lin Hua any insight on this or any reason why China almost free from virus so this is something I know what I'm going to say there are going to be many people who will become upset for me this is really strange either China's data is not reporting is not accurate or if they know how to handle it they have an antidote somewhere antidote somewhere they just know i mean they are look at their population and they controlled it so in the beginning they were remember they were locking people in and they were carrying them in the vans to the emergency hospitals and isolations at that time it didn't look like they have any antidote at this time, it is really strange for me to see that there is no data, no vaccination data. There is no infect, infection data. There is no further infections. So I am as curious as you are for why they are free of the uh, infection. What are If these are just good behaviors on people's part, we should learn from that. If they have some drugs, we should know what these are. I think at least that much China would owe to the world after this unfortunate thing that has happened. That, to say that, hey, we have something that you should use. I just do not know what it is. It's just very closed system. So testing says China is not virus free. So testing, are they just not reporting it? Random says, do you think flying to get a vaccine 10 hours is worth the risk or I will get the virus during the flight? I've, obesity, my country doesn't have vax. 
So random, this is a very interesting question. Some of my friends asked me, Dubai was giving vaccines. So some of my friends said that, should we just travel over to Dubai and get it? And my question was that, would you get it over the flight? And then what would happen? So I have the same answer for you as well. I do not know uh, if it is safe, especially if you have a comorbidity. I would, I would hope that you have vaccine very soon. And then meanwhile, you stay protected. But if you think you can travel with all the protections, they say that travel is safe. I just don't believe it. So I have not traveled. Um, so I think not a very valuable answer, but that's how I feel. So Rima says China is probably not reporting it. Rima, how are you? you I'm seeing you after a long time. <laughs> Douglas says Luffy Mectin. Yes, we have Luffy Mectin. Uh, <laughs> DDS says I fell asleep there. Did I miss anything? Nope. <laughs> okay, so so Ali G says should a woman start aspirin tab before going for the second AstraZeneca dose? So I will tell you about my wife's. I started her on anticoagulant soon after the vaccine. I just didn't want to take a risk. So the problem is that if I aspirin is generally pretty harmless, meaning it is not that if somebody is taking aspirin, it's going to cause a lot of problem. We take aspirin all the time for headaches and for fevers. So ideally, some level of protection should be there. The question is, how much would it protect? It's an over-the-counter thing. But it is, I did it for my family members. Craig Lively says, is there a difference in initial viral load between vaccinated and non-vaccinated persons time periods? So let me see if I catch the question. What you're saying is that, let's say if there is a person who's vaccinated, if they get the virus, will they have a greater load develop in their body or probably shed more or not versus a person who is not vaccinated? If that is the question, I can quickly answer that. And if I got the question wrong, my apologies. Um, so let's say this person here is vaccinated. And this person here is not, not vaccinated. Vaccinated person, and this could be vaccinated or a person who has been already infected and recovered. They should have somewhat of an IgA protection. So they should have in their mucosal membranes IgA present as well. But generally, you know, you cannot guarantee presence of IgA just like other antibodies that would decline, IgA would decline as well. But imagine if there is a person who has the IgA present if they do have IgA present, then what would happen is that as the virus arrives onto their mucous membranes, the IgA is going to bind it and they would have less of the virus entering the cell. So that reduces the viral load, one. Second, once they have entered the cell, the virus, and it breaks from the cell and it comes out, now the immune system that is sitting here is going to say, what the heck are you doing? And we, we know who you are. And it's going to very quickly start uh, producing antibodies and activating the cytotoxic T cells and just attacking this virus. So that means this threshold, its, its load will be kept in check. That also means that the shedding would be less. That also means that within the person, the load will be less and the symptoms will be milder and then they would just recover within 24, 48 hours. Now compare that to the non-vaccinated person uh, and again, not recovered person from an infection as well, their IgA is not going to have the, their mucous membrane is not going to have IgA. So of course, that means that they would have more virus easily entering the cell. That would cause more as the virus comes out. They also do not have the immune system ready yet other than the innate arm. So the virus is now going to have some free time for it. That free time can be anywhere from one week to two week in some people, even 29 days, although 29 days is an outlier. So all of this is happening. So immune system is getting ready while the virus is just increasing. So these folks would shed more and they would 
um, have more symptoms as well. Now, caveat to this, we know that there are many people who are not vaccinated, but when they become ill with COVID, they are asymptomatic or they have a very mild disease. So there are those folks as well, and that is the majority. So is it necessary that everybody who's unvaccinated would shed more? No, there are people who would just asymptomatically handle it. The question is who, and we do not know who. Omok Lamok says, China, why WHO doesn't question it? How the report cases are so low for a population of billions? Any insights on WHO action about China? You, you're asking questions that which have an underlying expectation that these, <laughs> these organizations will work correctly. They don't work correctly. So uh, asking them is counterproductive. It's not even useful to ask them. William Goff says, am I correct to think that two most common severe side effects of are blood clots or myocarditis, which can be easily prophylaxis with aspirin or ibuprofen and colchicine? Generally, yes. So I know that you are a healthcare professional, so I can talk with you in that way. So please, uh, others, don't take this as an advice because you still need to have your history, talk with your doctor. But yeah, William, uh, ideally, if it is myocarditis because of antibodies, then um, immunosuppressants or anti-inflammatory with ivermectin-like things would help. If it is myocarditis because of cy cytokines, which are then causing some issue with the heart, then anti-inflammatory would work. My thinking is it is going to be antibodies cross-reacting with pericardium. In that case, Anti-inflammatory would only reduce the inflammation, but not prevent the antibodies from block uh, from connecting with the tissue. So in that case, we'll have to give some other antibodies or something to stop the antibody production. And for the clotting, of course, um, anti-clottings would help. <laughs> John, John Ria says, uh, in sorry, by the time I'm clicking, the the, uh, the comments just scroll away. I was trying to click here. So in China, big pharma is called Big Charma. <laughs> um, Lord, Lord Fryo of Kent. <laughs> no, Fry, Lord Fry of Kent, very good. So is it the same Kent where the Kent virus came from? In Ontario, they are allowing construction to happen with few infection controls, which leads to over 32 infections in my city, but won't allow outdoor sports. What do you think of this? Silliness? <laughs> so that is the inconsistencies that we are seeing. Gabriel says connection between tinnitus and COVID. So tinnitus can occur because of the um, neurological outcomes that may be because of the serotonin, that may be because of the uh, inflammatory cytokines in the brain. Um, so their pathology is still not clear. However, what, what I've seen is in some people, it just continues to go on. And um, antihistamines can be tried, fluvoxamine can be tried. In some people, fluvoxamine causes the tinnitus to become aggravated. So then take it off and try antihistamine. And in some people, there is a complete recovery, majority of the people, but in some people, it just continues. So the house says, I've enjoyed every minute of the class and comments, but it is late. Good night. Good night to you as well. And I think it's time for us as well to wrap up. Um, so <clears throat> let's do Anupam. Kakar says, is there a possibility that there could be no symptoms at all and still you may have COVID? Yes. First day when you doubt you have high blood pressure and pulse and lose motion and then weakness, then you are fine. So yeah, that could be COVID. These are possibility of the COVID. Roman says, please see my super chat. Let's do that. Here. Roman, so thank you very much for the super chat. From our cool bean, Aaron J. Kurt 
Courtney, Twitter, straight from CDC, outbreak in Kentucky nursing home, vaccine efficacy, less than 95% in all areas, scary. So, you know, I'll I'll actually check this out. Aaron J. Courtney. Um, uh, Roman, am I on that tweet as well? So I'll look into that. Le vaccine efficacy less than 95%. Hmm. Okay, I'll look into that. So how about we break for now and we'll continue tomorrow morning. Hopefully I'll be fine in the morning. So uh, please like, subscribe and share. Um, and uh, like it at least. <laughs> so glad for you that you're doing well. After second shot, I know you have to be so happy and we are so happy for you. Thank you very much, William Goff. Uh, thank you to everyone for well wishes. I got so many. As much as I got tons of people cursing me and yelling at me, I got 99% more people uh, wishing well and congratulating and being happy with me. So thank you very much for this. Uh, please like, subscribe, and share. If you would like to support this work, there are three links in the description. One is if you don't like PayPal, then you can use Buy Me Coffees. Otherwise, you can be a Patreon as well, patron as well, and you can use PayPal to support too. So thank you very much, and uh, let's break. There is one more question here. Let me just answer this one, and we'll stop. Random says, what do you think is the safest vaccine, Pfizer, j, &J or Moderna, in terms of probability of severe side effects? I'm a 35-year-old. So male, female, if I assume that you are a male, then almost all of them are similarly effective and have similar safety profile. If I assume that you're a female, then you know that the adenovirus based vaccine may have a higher propensity for blood clotting. So that means j, &J may be lesser useful in that case and Pfizer and Moderna will be good. Now, I love Moderna, I love the Novavax, and I love Moderna. However, the data that has come across from Israel for Pfizer gives us a larger understanding of Pfizer. So Pfizer is useful as well. There is just that one problem that they are causing myocarditis in some young people, and though two of them died, and one woman and one man, one, I would say, young man and young woman, and that means it could cause this to a woman or a man. So that is the only concern and I have to do some more research on that. Cool, so with this, let's start for today and we will see each other tomorrow. Stay safe and healthy, bye-bye.